Overview of Anatomy and Physiology Human anatomy is the scientific study of the body's structures. Some of these structures are very small and can only be observed and analyzed with the assistance of a microscope. Other larger structures can readily be seen, manipulated, measured, and weighed. The word anatomy comes from a Greek word that means to cut apart. Human anatomy was first studied by observing the exterior of the body and observing the wounds of soldiers and other injuries. Later, physicians were allowed to dissect bodies of the dead to augment their knowledge. When a body is dissected, its structures are cut apart in order to observe their physical attributes and their relationships to one another. Dissection is still used in medical schools, anatomy courses, and pathology labs. In order to observe structures in living people, however, a number of imaging techniques have been developed. These techniques allow clinicians to visualize structures inside the living body, such as a cancerous tumor or a fractured bone. Like most scientific disciplines, anatomy has areas of specialization. Gross anatomy is the study of the larger structures of the body, those visible without the aid of magnification. Macro means large. Thus, gross anatomy is also referred to as macroscopic anatomy. In contrast, micro means small, and microscopic anatomy is the study of structures that can be observed only with the use of a microscope or other magnification device. Microscopic anatomy includes cytology, the study of cells, and histology, the study of tissues. As the technology of microscopes has advanced, anatomists have been able to observe smaller and smaller structures of the body, from slices of large structures like the heart to the three-dimensional structures of large molecules in the body. Anatomists take two general approaches to the study of the body structure, regional and systemic. Regional anatomy is the study of the interrelationships of all of the structures in a specific body region, such as the abdomen. Studying regional anatomy helps us appreciate the interrelationship of body structures, such as how muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and other structures work together to serve a particular body region. In contrast, systemic anatomy is the study of the structures that make up a discrete body system. That is, a group of structures that work together to perform a unique body function. For example, a systemic anatomical study of the muscular system would consider all of the skeletal muscles of the body. Whereas anatomy is about structure, physiology is about function. Human physiology is the scientific study of the chemistry and physics of the structures of the body and the ways in which they work together to support the functions of life. Much of the study of physiology centers on the body's tendency toward homeostasis. Homeostasis is the state of steady internal conditions maintained by living things. The study of physiology certainly includes observation, both with the naked eye and with microscopes, as well as manipulations and measurements. However, current advances in physiology usually depend upon carefully designed laboratory experiments that reveal the functions of the many structures and chemical compounds that make up the human body. Like anatomists, physiologists typically specialize in a particular branch of physiology. For example, neurophysiology is the study of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves and how these work together to perform functions as complex and diverse as vision, movement, and thinking. Physiologists may work from the organ level, for example, exploring what the different parts of the brain do, to the molecular level, such as exploring how an electrical signal travels along nerves. Form is closely related to function in all living things. For example, the thin flap of your eyelid can snap down to clear away dust particles and almost instantaneously slide back up to allow you to see again. At the microscopic level, the arrangement and function of the nerves and muscles that serve the eyelid allow for its quick action and retreat. At a smaller level of analysis, the function of these nerves and muscles likewise relies on the interactions of specific molecules and ions. Even the three-dimensional structure of certain molecules is essential to the function. 
Your study of anatomy and physiology will make more sense if you continually relate the form of the structures you are studying to their function. In fact, it can be somewhat frustrating to attempt to study anatomy without understanding the underlying physiology that a particular body structure supports. Imagine, for example, trying to appreciate the unique arrangement of the bones of the human hand if you had no concept of the function of the hand. Fortunately, your understanding of how the human hand manipulates tools, from pens to cell phones, helps you appreciate the unique alignment of the thumb in opposition to the four fingers, making your hand a structure that allows you to pinch and grasp objects and type messages. Before you begin to study the different structures and functions of the human body, it is helpful to consider its basic architecture. That is, how its smallest parts are assembled into larger structures. It is convenient to consider the structures of the body in terms of the fundamental levels of organization that increase in complexity. These include subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, organisms, and the biosphere. When discussing the levels of structural organization of the human body, the organization is often discussed in terms of six distinct levels of increasing complexity, from the smallest chemical building blocks to a unique human organism. This includes the chemical level, the cellular level, the tissue level, the organ level, the organ system level, and the organism level. At the chemical level, atoms bond to form molecules with three-dimensional structures. At the cellular level, a variety of molecules combine to form the fluid and organelles of the body's cells. At the tissue level, a community of similar cells form the body tissue. At the organ level, two or more different tissues combine to form an organ. At the organ system level, two or more organs work closely together to perform the functions of the body system. At the organismal level, many organ systems work harmoniously together to perform the functions of an independent organism. To study the chemical level of organization, scientists consider the simplest building blocks of matter, including subatomic particles, atoms, and molecules. All matter in the universe is composed of one or more unique pure substances called elements. Familiar examples of these elements include hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, calcium, and iron. The smallest unit of any of these pure substances or elements is the atom. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles, including protons, electrons, and neutrons. Two or more atoms combine to form a molecule, such as the water molecules, proteins, and sugars found in living things. Molecules are the chemical building blocks of all body structures. A cell is the smallest independently functioning unit of a living organism. Even bacteria, which are extremely small independently living organisms, have a cellular structure. All living structures of human anatomy contain cells, and almost all functions of the human physiology are performed in cells or are initiated by cells. A human cell typically consists of flexible membranes that enclose a cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the water-based cellular fluid together with a variety of tiny functioning units called organelles. In humans, as in all organisms, cells perform all functions of life. A tissue is a group of many similar cells or related types of cells that work together to perform a specific function. An organ is an anatomically distinct structure of the body composed of two or more tissue types. Each organ performs one or more specific physiological functions. An organ system is a group of organs that work together to perform major functions or to meet physiological needs of the body. Here, we discuss 11 distinct organ systems of the body. However, 
Be aware that assigning organs to specific organ systems may be imprecise since organs that belong to one system can also function integrally with other systems. In fact, most organs contribute to more than one system within the body. The integumentary system includes the hair, the skin, and the nails. It encloses the internal body structures and is the site of many sensory receptors. The skeletal system includes cartilage, bones, and joints. It supports the movements of the body along with the muscular system and supports the body's structure. The muscular system includes the tendons and the skeletal muscles. The muscular system enables movement along with the skeletal system and helps to maintain body temperature. The nervous system includes the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves. The nervous system functions to detect and process sensory information and to activate the body's responses. The endocrine system includes the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the pancreas, the adrenal glands, and the testes in men or ovaries in women. The endocrine system secretes body hormones and regulates body processes. The cardiovascular system includes the heart and the blood vessels. The cardiovascular system delivers oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and equalizes temperature in the body. The lymphatic system includes the thymus, the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the lymphatic vessels. The lymphatic system functions to return fluid to the blood and to defend against pathogens that can cause illness and disease. The respiratory system includes the nasal passages, the trachea, and the lungs. The respiratory system removes carbon dioxide from the body and delivers oxygen to the blood. The digestive system includes the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the large intestine, and small intestines. The digestive system processes food for use by the body and removes waste from undigested food. The urinary system includes the kidneys and the urinary bladder. The urinary system controls water balance in the body, removing waste from blood and excreting them. The male reproductive system includes the epididymis and the testes. The male reproductive system produces sex hormones and gametes called sperm. It also functions to deliver these gametes to the female for reproduction. The female reproductive system includes the mammary glands, the ovaries, and the uterus. The female reproductive system produces sex hormones and gametes called eggs or ova. It also supports the embryo or fetus until birth and produces milk for the infant. Finally, the organism level is the highest level of organization. An organism is a living being that has a cellular structure and that can independently perform all physiological functions necessary for life. In multicellular organisms, including humans, all cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems of the body work together to maintain the life and health of the organism. The different organ systems each have different functions and therefore unique roles to perform in physiology. These many functions can be summarized in terms of a few that we might consider definitive of human life. Organization, metabolism, responsiveness, movement, development, and reproduction. Organization. A human body consists of trillions of cells organized in a way that maintains distinct internal compartments. These compartments keep body cells separated from the external environmental threats and keep the cells moist and nourished. They also help to separate internal body fluids from the countless microorganisms that grow on body surfaces, including the lining of certain passageways that connect to the outer surface of the body. The intestinal tract, for example, is home to more bacterial cells than the total of all human cells in the human body. 
Yet, these bacteria are on the outside of the body and cannot be allowed to circulate freely inside the body. Cells, for example, have a cell membrane, also known as the plasma membrane. The cell membrane keeps the internal environment, that is, the fluids and organelles, separated from the external environment. Blood cells keep blood inside in a closed circulatory system. Nerves and muscles are wrapped in connective tissue sheaths that separates them from the surrounding structures. In the chest and abdomen, a variety of internal membranes keep major organs such as the lungs, heart, and kidneys separated from one another. The body's largest organ is the integumentary system. The integumentary system includes the skin and its associated structures, including the hair and nails. The surface tissue of the skin is a barrier that protects the internal structures and fluids from potentially harmful microorganisms and other toxins. Metabolism The first law of thermodynamics holds that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change form. Your basic function as an organism is to consume or ingest energy and molecules in the foods you eat, convert some of it into fuel for movement, sustain your body functions, and build and maintain your body structures. There are two types of reactions that accomplish this, anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is the process whereby smaller, simpler molecules are combined into larger, more complex substances. Your body can assemble the complex chemicals it needs by combining small molecules derived from the foods you eat. This process utilizes energy. Catabolism is the process by which larger, more complex substances are broken down into smaller, simpler molecules. Catabolism releases energy. The complex molecules found in foods are broken down so the body can use their parts to assemble the structures and substances needed for life. Taken together, these two processes, anabolism and catabolism, are called metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all anabolic and catabolic reactions that take place in the human body. Both anabolism and catabolism occur simultaneously and continuously to keep you alive. Every cell in your body makes use of a chemical compound called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, to store and release energy. The cell stores energy in the synthesis, or anabolism, of ATP, then moves the ATP molecule to the location where the energy is needed to fuel cellular activities. Then, the ATP is broken down, or catabolized, and a controlled amount of energy is released, which is used by the cell to perform a particular job. Responsiveness Responsiveness is the ability of an organism to adjust to changes in its external and internal environments. An example of responsiveness to external stimuli could include moving towards the sources of food and water and away from perceived dangers. Changes in an organism's internal environment, such as an increase in body temperature, can cause the responses of sweating and the dilation of blood vessels in the skin in order to decrease body temperature. Movement Human movement includes not only actions at the joints of the body, but also the motion of individual organs and each individual cell. Red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body. Muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and focus your vision. Glands are secreting chemicals to regulate your bodily functions. Your body is coordinating the action of entire muscle groups to enable you to move air into and out of your lungs, to push blood throughout your body, and to propel the food that you have eaten throughout your digestive tract. Consciously, of course, you can contract your skeletal muscles to move the bones of your skeleton to get from one place to another, and to carry out all of the activities of your daily life. Development Development is all of the changes the body goes through in life. Development includes the processes of differentiation in which unspecialized cells become specialized in structure and function to perform certain tasks in the body. Development also includes the processes of growth and repair, both of which involve cell differentiation. Growth Growth is the increase in body size. 
humans, like all multicellular organisms, grow by increasing the number of existing cells, increasing the amount of non-cellular material around cells, and, within very narrow limits, increasing the size of existing cells. Reproduction Reproduction is the formation of a new organism from parent organisms. In humans, reproduction is carried out by the male and female reproductive systems. Because death will come to all complex organisms, without reproduction, the line of organisms would end. Humans have been adapting to life on Earth for at least the past 200,000 years. Earth and its atmosphere have provided us with air to breathe, water to drink, and food to eat. But these are not the only requirements for survival. Although you may rarely think about it, you also cannot live outside of a certain range of temperature and pressure that the surface of our planet and its atmosphere provides. The four requirements for human life are oxygen, nutrients, a narrow range of temperatures, and a narrow range of atmospheric pressures. Oxygen Atmospheric oxygen is only about 20% oxygen, but that oxygen is a key component of the chemical reactions that keep the body alive, including the reactions that produce ATP. Brain cells are especially sensitive to lack of oxygen because of their requirement for high and steady production of ATP. Brain damage is likely within 5 minutes without oxygen, and death is likely within 10 minutes. Nutrients A nutrient is a substance in food and beverages that is essential to human survival. The three basic classes of nutrients are water, the energy-yielding and body-building nutrients, and the micronutrients, which includes vitamins and minerals. The most critical nutrient is water. Depending on the environmental temperature and our state of health, we may be able to survive for only a few days without water. The body's functional chemicals are dissolved and transported in water, and the chemical reactions of life take place in water. Moreover, water is the largest component of cells, blood, and the fluid between cells. And water makes up about 70% of the adult's body mass. Water also helps regulate our internal temperature and cushions, protects, and lubricates joints and many other bodily structures. The energy-yielding nutrients are primarily carbohydrates and lipids, while proteins mainly supply the amino acids that are the building blocks of the body itself. You ingest these nutrients in plant and animal foods and beverages and the digestive system breaks them down into molecules small enough to be absorbed. The breakdown of products of carbohydrates and lipids can then be used in the metabolic process that converts them to ATP. Although you might feel as if you were starving after missing a meal, you can actually survive without consuming the energy-yielding nutrients for at least several weeks. Water and the energy-yielding nutrients are also referred to as macronutrients because the body needs them in large amounts. In contrast, micronutrients are the vitamins and minerals. These elements and compounds participate in many essential chemical reactions and processes, such as nerve impulses. Some, such as calcium, also contribute to the body's structure. Your body can store some of the micronutrients in its tissues and draw on those reserves if you fail to consume them in your diet for a few days or even weeks. Other micronutrients, such as vitamin C and most of the B vitamins, are water-soluble and cannot be stored, so you will need to consume vitamins B and C every day or two. Narrow Range of Temperatures you have probably seen the news stories about athletes who died of heat stroke or hikers who died of exposure to cold. Such deaths occur because the chemical reactions upon which the body depends can only take place within a very narrow range of body temperatures, from just below or just above 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 
When body temperature rises well above or drops well below normal, certain proteins called enzymes that facilitate chemical reactions lose their normal structure and lose their ability to function. Thus, the chemical reactions of metabolism cannot proceed. That said, the body can respond effectively to short-term exposure to heat or cold. One of the body's responses to heat is sweating. As sweat evaporates from skin, it removes some thermal energy from the body, thereby cooling it. Adequate water from the extracellular fluid in the body is necessary to produce sweat, so adequate fluid intake is essential to balance that loss during the sweat response. Not surprisingly, the sweat response is much less effective in a humid environment because the air is already saturated with water. Thus, the sweat on the skin's surface is not able to evaporate and the internal body temperature gets dangerously high. The body can also respond effectively to short-term cold exposure. One response to cold is shivering, muscle movements that generates heat. Another response is increased breakdown of stored energy to generate heat. When that energy reserve is depleted, however, the core temperature begins to drop significantly and red blood cells will lose their ability to give up oxygen, denying the brain of its critical component, ATP production. This lack of oxygen can cause confusion, lethargy, and eventually loss of consciousness and death. The body responds to cold by reducing blood circulation to the extremities, including the hands and the feet, in order to prevent blood from cooling there so that the body's core can stay warm. Even when the body's core temperature remains stable, however, tissues that are exposed to severe cold, especially fingers and toes, can develop frostbite. Frostbite is when the blood flow to the extremities has been reduced greatly. This form of tissue damage can be permanent and can lead to gangrene, requiring amputation of the affected region. Narrow range of atmospheric pressure. Pressure is a force exerted by a substance that is in contact with another substance. Atmospheric pressure is pressure that is exerted by the mixture of gases in the Earth's atmosphere. These are primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Although you may not perceive it, atmospheric pressure is constantly pressing down on your body. This pressure keeps gases within your body, such as the gaseous nitrogen in bodily fluids, dissolved. If you were suddenly ejected from a spaceship above Earth's atmosphere, you would go from a situation of normal pressure to one of very low pressure. The pressure of the nitrogen gas in your blood would be much higher than the pressure of nitrogen in the space surrounding the cells of your body. As a result, the nitrogen gas in your blood would expand, forming bubbles that could block blood vessels and even cause cells to break apart. Atmospheric pressure does more than just keep blood gases dissolved. Your ability to breathe, that is, to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide, also depends upon a precise atmospheric pressure. Altitude sickness occurs in part because the atmosphere at high altitudes exerts less pressure, reducing the exchange of these gases and causing shortness of breath, confusion, headache, lethargy, and nausea. Mountain climbers carry oxygen to reduce the effects of both low oxygen levels and low barometric pressures at higher altitudes. The dynamic pressure of bodily fluids is also important to human survival. For example, blood pressure, which is the pressure exerted by blood as it flows within blood vessels, must be great enough to enable blood to reach all body tissues, and yet low enough to ensure that the delicate blood vessels can withstand the friction and force of the pulsating flow of pressurized blood homeostasis requires that the body continuously monitor its internal conditions. From body temperature to blood pressure to levels of certain nutrients, each physiological condition has a particular set point. A set point is the physiological value around which the normal range fluctuates. 
A normal range is the restricted set of values that is optimally healthy and stable. For example, the set point for normal human body temperature is approximately 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Physiological parameters such as body temperature and blood pressure tend to fluctuate within a normal range of a few degrees above or below that point. Control centers in the brain and other parts of the body monitor and react to deviations from homeostasis using negative feedback. Negative feedback is a mechanism that reverses a deviation from such a set point. Therefore, negative feedback maintains body parameters within their normal range. The maintenance of homeostasis by negative feedback goes on throughout the body at all times, and an understanding of negative feedback is thus fundamental to understanding human physiology. Negative Feedback a negative feedback system has three basic components, a sensor, a control center, and an effector. A sensor, also referred to as a receptor, is a component of the feedback system that monitors a physiological value. This value is then reported to the control center. The control center is the component in a feedback system that compares the value reported to it to the normal range. If the value deviates too much from the set point, then the control center activates an effector. An effector is the component in the feedback system that causes a change to reverse the situation and return the value to the normal range. In order to set the system in motion, a stimulus must drive a physiological parameter beyond its normal range, that is, beyond homeostasis. This stimulus is sensed by a specific sensor. For example, in the control of blood glucose, specific endocrine cells in the pancreas detect excess glucose as the stimulus in the bloodstream. These pancreatic beta cells respond to the increased level of blood glucose by releasing the hormone insulin into the bloodstream. The insulin signals skeletal muscle fibers, fat cells, and liver cells to take up the excess glucose, removing it from the bloodstream. As glucose concentration in the bloodstream drops, the decrease in concentration via a negative feedback mechanism is detected by pancreatic alpha cells and insulin release stops. This prevents blood sugar levels from continuing to drop below the normal range. Humans have a similar temperature regulation feedback system that works by promoting either heat loss or heat gain. When the brain's temperature regulation center receives data from the sensors indicating that the body's temperature exceeds its normal range, it stimulates a cluster of brain cells referred to as the heat loss center. The stimulation has three major effects. First, the blood vessels in the skin begin to dilate, allowing more blood from the core to flow to the surface of the skin allowing the heat to radiate into the environment. Second, as the blood flow to the skin increases, sweat glands are activated to increase their output. As the sweat evaporates from the skin surface into the surrounding air, it takes heat with it. Third, the depth of respiration increases and a person may breathe through an open mouth instead of through the nasal passageways. This further increases heat loss from the lungs. In contrast, activation of the brain's heat gain center by exposure to cold reduces blood flow to the skin, and blood returning from the limbs is diverted into a network of deep veins. This arrangement traps heat closer to the body's core and restricts heat loss. If heat loss is severe, the brain triggers an increase in random signals to skeletal muscles, causing them to contract and produce shivering. The muscle contractions of shivering release heat while using up ATP. The brain triggers the thyroid gland in the endocrine system to release thyroid hormone, 
which increases metabolic activity and heat production in cells throughout the body. The brain also signals the adrenal glands to release epinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline. This hormone causes the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, which can then be used as an energy source. The breakdown of glycogen into glucose results in an increased metabolism and heat production. Positive feedback. Positive feedback intensifies a change in the body's physiological condition rather than reversing it. A deviation from the normal range results in more change and the system moves further away from the normal range. Positive feedback in the body is normal only when there is a definite endpoint. Childbirth and the body's response to blood loss are two examples of positive feedback loops that are normal but activated only when needed. Childbirth at full term is an example of a situation in which the maintenance of the body's existing state is not desired. Enormous changes in the mother's body are required to give birth at the end of pregnancy. The events of childbirth, once begun, must progress rapidly to a conclusion or the life of the mother and the baby would be at risk. The extreme muscular work of labor and delivery are the result of a positive feedback system. The first contractions of labor, the stimulus, push the baby towards the cervix, which is the lowest part of the uterus. The cervix contains stretch-sensitive nerve cells that monitor the degree of stretching. These would be the sensors. These nerve cells send messages to the brain, which in turn causes the pituitary gland at the base of the brain to release the hormone oxytocin into the bloodstream. Oxytocin causes stronger contractions of the smooth muscle of the uterus. These are the effectors. Thus, the baby is pushed further down the birth canal. This causes an even greater stretching of the cervix. This cycle of stretching, oxytocin release, and increasingly more forceful contractions stops only when the baby is born. At this point, the stretching of the cervix halts, stopping the release of oxytocin. A second example of positive feedback centers on reversing extreme damage to the body. Following a penetrating wound, the most immediate threat is excessive blood loss. Less blood circulating means reduced blood pressure and reduced perfusion or penetration of the blood to the brain and other vital organs. If perfusion is severely reduced, vital organs will shut down and the person will die. The body responds to this potential catastrophe by releasing substances into the injured blood vessel wall that begin the process of blood clotting. As each step of clotting occurs, it stimulates the release of more clotting substances. This accelerates the processes of clotting and sealing off the damaged area. Clotting is contained in a local area based on the tightly controlled availability of these clotting proteins. This is an adaptive, life-saving cascade of events. Anatomists and healthcare providers use terminology that can be bewildering to the uninitiated. However, the purpose of this language is not to confuse, but rather to increase precision and reduce medical errors. For example, is a scar above the wrist located on the forearm two or three inches away from the hand? Or is it at the base of the hand? Is it on the palm side or the back side of the hand? By using precise anatomical terminology, we eliminate ambiguity. Anatomical terms are derived from ancient Greek and Latin words. Because these languages are no longer used in everyday conversation, the meaning of their words do not change. Anatomical terms are made up of roots, prefixes, and suffixes. The root of a term often refers to an organ, tissue, or condition, whereas the prefix or suffix often describes the root word. For example, in the disorder hypertension, the prefix hyper means high or over, and the root word tension refers to pressure. So, 
The word hypertension refers to abnormally high blood pressure. Anatomical position. To further increase precision, anatomists standardize the way in which they will view the body. Just as maps are normally oriented with north at the top, the standard body map or anatomical position is that of the body standing upright with the feet at shoulder width and parallel, toes pointing forward. The upper limbs are held out to each side slightly and the palms of the hands face forward. Using this standard position reduces confusion. It does not matter how the body being described is oriented. The terms are used as if they were in anatomical position. For example, a scar that is in the anterior carpal region would be present on the palm side of the wrist. The term anterior would be used even if the hand were palm down on the table. A body that is lying down is described to be either prone or supine. Prone describes a face down orientation and supine describes a face-up orientation. These terms are sometimes used to describe the position of the body during specific physical examinations or surgical procedures. Regional terms. The human body's numerous regions have specific terms to help increase precision. Notice that the term brachium or arm is reserved for the upper arm and the antebrachium, or forearm, is used for the term meaning lower arm. Similarly, the femur, or thigh, refers to the upper portion of the leg, whereas leg, or cruce, is reserved for the lower portion of the leg existing between the knee and the ankle. Directional terms. Certain directional terms appear throughout this and any other anatomy tutorial. These terms are essential for describing the relative positions of different body structures. For instance, an anatomist might describe one band of tissue as inferior to another, or a physician might describe a tumor as being superficial to a deeper body structure. Some common terms that you should commit to memory in order to avoid confusion when you are studying or describing locations of particular body parts are as follows. Anterior or ventral describes the front or direction towards the front of the body. For example, the toes are anterior to the foot. Posterior or dorsal describes the back or the direction toward the back of the body. For example, the heel is posterior to the toes. Superior or cranial describes a position above or higher than another part of the body. For example, the eyebrows are superior to the nose. Inferior or caudal describes a position below or lower than another part of the body, or near or toward the tail in humans, or the coccyx, which is the lowest part of the spinal column. For example, the pelvis is inferior to the abdomen. Lateral describes the side or direction towards the side of the body. For example, the thumb or pollex is lateral to the digits. Medial describes the middle or direction toward the middle or center line of the body. For example, the halix or big toe is the most medial of the toes. Proximal describes a position in a limb that is nearer to the point of attachment or the trunk of the body. For example, the brachium would be proximal to the antebrachium. Distal describes a position in a limb that is further from the point of attachment or trunk of the body. For example, the cruce is distal to the femur. Superficial describes a position closer to the surface of the body. For example, the skin would be superficial to the bones. Deep describes a position that is further from the surface of the body. For example, the brain would be deep to the skull. Body planes. A section is a two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional structure that has been cut. 
modern medical imaging devices enable clinicians to obtain virtual sections of living bodies. We call these scans. Body sections and scans can be correctly interpreted only if the viewer understands the plane along which the section was made. A plane is an imaginary two-dimensional surface that passes through the body. There are three planes commonly referred to in anatomy and medicine. The sagittal plane, the frontal plane or coronal plane, and the transverse or horizontal plane. The sagittal plane is the plane that divides the body or an organ vertically into right and left sides. If this vertical plane runs directly down the middle of the body, it is called the mid-sagittal or median plane. If it divides the body into an unequal right and left side, it is called a parasagittal plane or less commonly a longitudinal section. The frontal plane is the plane that divides the body or an organ into an anterior or front portion and a posterior or rear portion. The frontal plane is often referred to as a coronal plane. The transverse plane is the plane that divides the body or an organ horizontally into upper and lower portions. Transverse planes produce images often referred to as cross sections. Body cavities and serous membranes. The body maintains its internal organization by means of membranes, sheaths, or other structures that separate compartments. The dorsal or posterior cavity and the ventral or anterior cavity are the largest body compartments. These cavities contain and protect delicate internal organs, and the ventral cavity allows for significant changes in the size and shape of the organs as they perform their functions. The lungs, heart, stomach, and intestines can expand and contract without distorting other tissues or disrupting the activities of nearby organs. Subdivisions of the posterior or dorsal and anterior or ventral cavities are each subdivided into smaller cavities. In the posterior cavity, the cranial cavity houses the brain and the spinal cavity or vertebral cavity encloses the spinal cord. Just as the brain and spinal cord make up a continuous, uninterrupted structure, the cranial and spinal cavities that house them are also continuous. The brain and spinal cord are protected by the bones of the skull and the vertebral column and by cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is a colorless fluid produced by the brain, which cushions the brain and spinal cord within the posterior cavity. The anterior cavity has two main subdivisions, the thoracic cavity and the abdominopelvic cavity. The thoracic cavity is the more superior subdivision of the anterior cavity, and it is enclosed by the rib cage. The thoracic cavity contains the lungs and the heart, which are located in the mediastinum. The diaphragm forms the floor of the thoracic cavity and separates it from the more inferior abdominopelvic cavity. The abdominopelvic cavity is the largest cavity in the body. Although no membrane physically divides the abdominal pelvic cavity, it can be useful to distinguish between the abdominal cavity, which houses the digestive organs, and the pelvic cavity, which houses the organs of reproduction. To promote clear communication, healthcare providers typically divide up the abdominal cavity into either nine regions or four quadrants. The more detailed regional approach subdivides the cavity with one horizontal line immediately inferior to the ribs and one immediately superior to the pelvis. Also, two vertical lines are drawn as if dropped from the midpoint of each clavicle or collarbone. There are nine resulting regions. The simpler quadrants approach, which is more commonly used in medicine, subdivides the cavity with one horizontal and one vertical line that intersects at the patient's umbilicus or belly button. A serous membrane, also known as the serosa, 
is one of the thin membranes that covers the walls and organs in the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. The parietal layers of membranes line the walls of the body cavity. The visceral layer of the membrane covers the organs. This is called the viscera. Between the parietal and the visceral layers is a very thin, fluid-filled serosal space or cavity. There are three serous cavities, each having their own associated membranes. The pleura is the serous membrane that encloses the pleural cavity. The pleural cavity surrounds the lungs. The pericardium is the serous membrane that encloses the pericardial cavity, and the pericardial cavity surrounds the heart. The peritoneum is the serous membrane that encloses the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity surrounds several organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity. The serous membranes form fluid-filled sacs or cavities that are meant to cushion and reduce friction on the internal organs. Both parietal and visceral serosa secrete thin, slippery serous fluid located within the serous cavities. The pleural cavity reduces friction between the lungs and the body wall. Likewise, the pericardial cavity reduces friction between the heart and the wall of the pericardium. The peritoneal cavity reduces friction between the abdominal and pelvic organs and the body wall. Therefore, serous membranes provide additional protection to the viscera that they enclose by reducing friction that could lead to inflammation of the organs. For thousands of years, fear of the dead and legal sanctions limited the ability of anatomists and physicians to study the internal structures of the human body. An inability to control bleeding, infection, and pain make surgeries infrequent and those that were performed, such as wound suturing, amputations, tumor removals, skull drilling, and cesarean births, did not greatly advance knowledge about internal anatomy. Theories about the function of the body and about disease were therefore largely based on external observations and imagination. During the 14th and 15th centuries, however, the detailed anatomical drawings of Italian artist and anatomist Leonardo da Vinci and Flemish anatomist Andreas Vesalius were published, and interest in human anatomy began to increase. Medical schools began to teach anatomy using human dissection, although some resorted to grave robbing in order to obtain corpses. Laws were eventually passed that enabled students to dissect the corpses of criminals and those who donated their bodies for research. Still, it was not until the late 19th century that medical researchers discovered non-surgical methods to look inside the living body. X-rays. German physicist Wilhelm Bronchin was experimenting with electrical current when he discovered that a mysterious invisible ray would pass through his flesh and leave an outline of his bones on a screen coated with a metal compound. In 1895, Ronchgen made the first durable record of the internal parts of a living human. This was an x-ray image of his wife's hand. Scientists around the world quickly began their own experiments with x-rays. By 1900, X-rays were widely used to detect a variety of injuries and diseases. In 1901, Ronchgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize for Physics for his work in this field. The X-ray is a form of high-energy electromagnetic radiation with a short wavelength capable of penetrating solids and ionizing gases. As they are used in medicine, x-rays are emitted from an x-ray machine and directed toward a specially treated metallic plate placed behind a patient's body. The beam of radiation results in a darkening of the x-ray plate. X-rays are slightly impeded by soft tissues which show up as gray on the x-ray plate, whereas hard tissues such as bone largely block the x-rays producing a light-toned shadow. 
Thus, x-rays are usually used to visualize hard body structures such as teeth and bones. Like many forms of high energy radiation, however, x-rays are capable of damaging cells and initiating changes that can lead to cancer. This danger of excessive exposure to x-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Refinements and enhancements of x-ray techniques have continued throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Although often supplanted by more sophisticated imaging techniques, the x-ray still remains a workhorse in medical imaging, especially for viewing fractures and for dentistry. The disadvantage of irradiation to the patient and the operator is now attenuated by proper shielding and by limiting exposure. Modern Medical Imaging X-rays can depict a two-dimensional image of a body region only from a single angle. In contrast, more recent medical imaging technologies produce data that is integrated and analyzed by computers, producing a three-dimensional image or images that reveal aspects of body functioning. Computed Tomography Tomography refers to imaging by sections. Commuted tomography, or CT, is a non-invasive imaging technique, sometimes called a CAT scan. A CAT scan, or CT, uses computers to analyze several cross-sectional x-rays in order to reveal minute details about structures in the body. The technique was invented in 1970 and is based on the principle that, as x-rays pass through the body, they are absorbed or reflected at different levels. In this technique, a patient lies on a motorized platform, while a computerized axial tomography, or CAT scanner, rotates 360 degrees around the patient, taking x-ray images. A computer then combines these images into a two-dimensional view of the scanned area, or slice. Since 1970, the development of more powerful computers and more sophisticated software has made CT scanning routine for many types of diagnostic evaluations. It is especially useful for soft tissue scanning, such as of the brain and the thoracic and abdominal viscera. Its level of detail is so precise that it can allow physicians to measure the size of a mass down to a millimeter. The main disadvantage of CT scanning is that it exposes patients to a dose of radiation many times higher than that of x-rays. In fact, children who undergo CT scans are at increased risk of developing cancer, as are adults who have had multiple CT scans. Magnetic Resonance Imaging Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or MRI, is a non-invasive medical imaging technique based on a phenomenon of nuclear physics discovered in 1930. In this technique, it was discovered that matter exposed to magnetic fields and radio waves was found to emit radio signals. In 1970, a physician and researcher named Raymond Damagian noticed that malignant or cancerous tissue gave off different signals than normal body tissue. He applied for a patent for the first MRI scanning device, which was in use clinically by the early 1980s. The early MRI scanners were crude, but advances in digital computing and electronics led to their advancement over any other technique for precise imaging, especially to discover tumors. MRI also has the major advantage of not exposing patients to radiation. The drawbacks of MRI scans include their high cost and patient discomfort with the procedure. The MRI scanner subjects the patient to such powerful electromagnetics that the scan room must be shielded. The patient must be enclosed in a metal tube-like device for the duration of the scan, sometimes as long as 30 minutes, which may be uncomfortable and impractical for ill patients. The device is also so noisy that even with earplugs, patients can become anxious or even fearful. 
these problems have been overcome somewhat with the development of open MRI scanning, which does not require the patient to be entirely enclosed in the metal tube. Patients with iron-containing metallic implants cannot undergo MRI scanning because it can dislodge these implants. Functional MRIs detect the concentration of blood flow in certain parts of the body. These are increasingly being used to study the activity in parts of the brain during various activities. This has helped scientists to learn more about the locations of the different brain functions and more about the brain abnormalities and diseases. Positron Emission Tomography Positron Emission Tomography, or PET, is a medical imaging technique involving the use of so-called radiopharmaceuticals. Radiopharmaceuticals are substances that emit a radiation that is short-lived and therefore relatively safe to administer to the body. Although the first PET scanner was introduced in 1961, it took more than 15 years before radiopharmaceuticals were combined with the technique and revolutionized its potential. The main advantage of the PET scan is that it can illustrate physiological activity, including nutrient metabolism and blood flow of organs being targeted, whereas CT and MRI scans can only show static images. PET is widely used to diagnose a multitude of conditions, including heart disease, the spread of cancer, certain forms of infection, brain abnormalities, bone disease, and thyroid disease. Ultrasonography Ultrasonography is an imaging technique that uses the transmission of high-frequency sound waves into the body to generate an echo signal that is converted by a computer into a real-time image of anatomy and physiology. Ultrasonography is the least invasive of all imaging techniques, and it is therefore used more freely in sensitive situations such as pregnancy. This technology was first developed in the 1940s and 50s. Ultrasonography is used to study heart function, blood flow in the neck or extremities, certain conditions such as gallbladder disease, and fetal growth and development. The main disadvantages of ultrasonography are that the image quality is heavily operator dependent and that it is unable to penetrate bone and gas. Thank you for watching.